Welcome to a new video in the introduction series to systems biology. And this now is a summary of uh, the lectures that I have been uh, given uh, uh, on the specific topic of fitting the model to the data. And here I will go through all the three things that are involved in that, which is simulating the model, formulating a cost function and doing the optimization. So fitting the model to the data, and this is now uh, the ordinary lecture slides. So we are uh, still in this part, uh, in this phase one here. And we are now moving from this cloud. We have learned to formulate the model in previous videos, and now we are approaching, uh, approaching this cloud here. So the first thing to do is to uh, learn to simulate the model. And uh, why do you want to simulate the model? Well, it's simply because you want to know what the model is doing. Uh, and in order to know what the model is doing, you need to solve the equations. Uh, so these differential equations. Uh, and this can, for systems biology model, almost never be done analytically. So therefore you have to do it numerically. Uh, and uh, the most intuitive way to do that is to use Euler forward, and it simply steps in the uh, in the directory in the direction of the gradient. So it calculates the gradient, and then it goes in a step in this direction. And this Euler forward is the best method to understand how this is done. Uh, so in the next slide, I will go through how this is done. Uh, but in practice, you're not using Euler forward. You are using more advanced methods that changes the step size and have error control of various sources of, of various forms. So what is Euler forward doing? Well, uh, here we have a differential equation. Uh, so we have something we want to simulate y here. So we have the, a, a differential equation for y as a function of time. And this differential equation means that wherever we are, so for instance, if we are here, we can calculate the time derivative. So here the time derivative starting here goes down. Here the time derivative starting here goes up and so on. And here all the red arrows here are simply time derivatives that has been plotted for all the different starting points. And that is what the differential equation is. It, it tells you, Give me an initial condition and I will, I will tell you, or give me a state and I will tell you what the derivative is. This is what the differential equation says. And then when you have an initial condition, so you have a starting point, which is in this case is here, then you can propagate, you can use these derivatives to go from the initial condition onwards in the direction of the gradient. So if we start here, then there is a red, uh, red arrow the flow here is going upwards and a little bit forward. Uh, and then you step maybe to here, then you calculate it again, and then you can uh, basically go in the same direction until you here after a while, or maybe you come all the way to this one here. And then you see that it's going in a slightly different direction here. And then here it's a little bit new direction again. And then, uh, so here the derivative has changed from being positive to being negative and you're going down. And you have a nice smooth solution here, which is a numerical integration. So it's a numerical solution to the differential equation. And this is, if, if everything works fine, it will have a nice smooth curve like this, like this yellow one here. But uh, the problem with this Euler forward and the reason why you're not using this in practice is that it's very easy that you take two long steps and if you take two long steps then instead of getting a smooth curve like the yellow one here you uh, if you take a two long step you will end up here instead and then you immediately switch to a negative uh, and then you go down and now you have negative not only negative derivative but negative values and then you're really in trouble so eventually here or pretty quickly you will diverge to some some uh, uh, other place that you don't want to be in and uh, and and overall the behavior that you're getting out is is completely uh, is completely wrong so the numerical solution is completely wrong compared to the correct solution to the to the system so therefore you don't use euler but euler is in practice but it's good to understand how things are done uh, and 
and then we have the inputs and the outputs and this I have explained already in previous videos so I won't go through this now uh, but I will uh, drop in um, basically here we have measured input the noted y and simulated input the noted y hat and a basic assumption is that the uh, the measured output uh, has been generated from the model for some true parameters p0 here uh, plus some noise uh, nu here so this is the Greek symbol nu and uh, and uh, this is the measurement equation for some true parameters here uh, plus some noise so this is the assumption that that you usually use and if that is the assumption then it means that there are some parameters which are ideal and those would typically be the ones that we are looking for something that is as close as possible to these true parameters p0 so let's figure out how to do that and the basic principle for doing that is to uh, uh, focus on the residuals and the residuals is the difference between the measured and the simulated output so here is the measured output and here is the simulated output and here we have it for a specific time point and for this specific time point we have a specific residual epsilon here and these residuals simply say how far away are you from being able to uh, go through the data points and um, this uh, gives a sort of point by point measure of that but but you want to uh, uh, to, to get the sort of average value for all of these all of these deviations and that average value uh, you get by taking the sum of all of these guys uh, but uh, in practice it's not a good idea to sum them together but rather to use a formula like this where the sum is a part of it but you also do other things and when you use a formula like this you, you have the most uh, common way of formulating a cost function so the residual is simply the distance between the simulated and measured uh, and then you use these to generate the cost function uh, and if we should just quickly understand how this is structured here we have the residual and since the only thing we are caring about is the distance between these two not whether uh, one is above the other or 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 vice versa we take the square so so we take the square because then no matter if this one is bigger than this one or the other way around we get the positive value and uh, this symbol here is um, is the uncertainty the standard deviation of the measurement noise and this basically means that if the data point that we are here at time point t is very uncertain so it has a big standard deviation we have a very uncertain data point then we divide with a very big value and if we divide with a, with a very big value uh, if you divide with something big then the whole term for that time point will be very small so then it's not so crucial if you're close or not but if you have a small standard deviation so we have a very well determined data point then it's very crucial then you divide with something small which means that this here will be will be uh, very big compared to the other terms so this noise here is to compensate for the uncertainty of the data and and then once you have done that once you have ensured that uh, the distance between the uh, these residuals always are positive that you compensate for the accuracy in the data point then you can simply just sum them all together and you have a single value that that tells you sort of on average how how good uh, is the model at being close to the data and the final thing that appears here outside everything is just the square root and the square root is simply there to to make these numbers not grow too fast but uh, 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 the optimum the the parameters that will give the best value here will be the same independently of if you have the square root or not so you can have the square root or you can take it away it doesn't matter but these two other things they are pretty important to uh, uh, to always make it positive which you can do for instance with the square or you can just take the absolute value and to compensate for the uncertainty in the data and the basic principle is that if you have a cost function it will take the parameters as input 
and it will give this single value, single, single, single value, like 18.5 or something like this. A single value that tells you how good the model is on average for these parameters that it, it has been given, these parameters that have been used to do the simulation, how good the model is for these parameters at describing the data on average. And the lower the number, the better the agreement with the data. So you want to find the parameters that gives the, the, uh, the lowest cost here. So this is basically what it says here. A cost function gives the goodness of fit, how, how good is the model at fitting to the data for each parameter value. And once we have this, we, we have an automated way of knowing how good the model is, and then we can simply uh, we can simply search through all the parameters. And uh, if uh, we don't want to do that by hand, which seldom is a good idea, uh, we can uh, use this cost function to do this automatically using uh, an optimization algorithm. So we can optimize this function v here to find the best agreement with the data. And um, you can do this either using local or global methods. And I will go through the difference, be the distance between, uh, or the difference between these two now in a little while. And a good thing to keep in mind is that this optimum that you are finding is usually not unique, and this will become crucial when you look at the predictions later. So now let's uh, go to the first of these two types of optimization methods. So local optimizations, they uh, look around themselves. So they take the, the, the given data point and then they look in a small environment to find the best direction to go in, the, 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 direc the direction that, that seems to be the most ideal to go in if you want to find the optimum. And some, um, some, uh, some common ways of doing this uh, are uh, quasi-Newton methods. Newton-Repson is the, maybe the most fast one, but it's also the most unstable one. So usually you use some, uh, some uh, more stable one, which is quasi-Newton methods. And this is really, really stable, but it's also really, really slow. It's called the second method. Um, in the computer lab, uh, we use another method, which is good if the cost function is a little bit bumpy. So if it sort of is not completely smooth, then, we, then it, it might be good to use something called the nonlinear simplex method. And this is the one that we use in the computer lab. So in contrast now, um, global optimization methods, they can, uh, they not only go um, uh, in the direction that gives the best agreement, uh, or, or that, that, that seems to give the best improvement in, in terms of cost, but sometimes they go in a direction that seems temporarily to give a worse agreement with the data, only to, uh, uh, to be able to cover the entire parameter space better to not get stuck in this local minima. And also for these global optimization methods, there are many, many versions, both stochastic and deterministic. And in the computer lab, we use something called simulated annealing. Um, and this simulated annealing, it's actually using this nonlinear simplex and plus a stochastic term. And uh, if you want to know more about uh, the, the settings to this uh, stochastic thing and the temperature and so on, there is some information on on Rizoma. So now let's have a look at, um, at uh, a cost function landscape here. So on the x-axis here, we have uh, different parameter values. On the y-axis here, we, we have uh, how good the model is. Uh, so uh, here are for different parameter values, we see that this is, a good, this is a good parameter. It has a small cost function, and this is a really bad parameter here because it has a very high cost function. So what you want to do is to um, uh, is to search through all the parameters and find the best one. And if you do this using a local method, you will start somewhere with a starting guess, maybe here, and then you will go in the direction that seems to be improving, which is downhill, 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 until you stop. And this is where you get stuck. So this you will say is the best one. So uh, the input to the uh, optimization algorithm is the start guess, for instance, this one, and the output is the optimal parameters, so here. Um, 
But if you have a global optimization algorithm, it will not only search downhill here, but it will also climb uphill and it will search here and it will climb up this hill here and search here and see and it will see that ah this one is a little bit better. So it will find the global minimum and it will uh, it will search here. So so that's basically the difference between a local method which only goes downhill and a global method which also which sort of looks for the global optimum and finds it. it can also go uphill. Okay, so let's sum all of this up. Um, in order to fit the model to, to some data, you need to be able to simulate it. And that you do by starting at the initial condition, and then you go in the direction of the flow. And, and uh, you, you should do this uh, with a sufficiently small step in order for it to work. And you need to find the optimal step size. But the, but the basic principle that you, uh, that you use in this Euler forward is to just go in the direction of the flow. And then um, we need to specify inputs and inputs and outputs, and this we already went through. And then, in order to fit the, the simulation or to or to find the parameters that give the best simulation agreement with the data, we use the residuals, which is uh, the measured y minus the simulated y hat, and you sum them together, and you weigh with the, you 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 do it. Uh, where you uh, take the absolute value or the square and you compensate for the measurement uncertainty. And this together gives you the cost function, which takes the parameters as input and give the agreement with the data as output. And then this cost function is used by an optimization algorithm, which takes the start guess as input and an optimal parameter as output. And there are two different versions. There is the local optimization method and the global optimization method. So, this is the final thing that is included for Duga 1. So, good luck.